Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for the introduction and for the invitation to present at the, uh, at the meeting. So today I'm going to be talking about some of our recent funding on uh, the work that we've been doing since actually the last meeting in Kigali. And our research program focuses on understanding both genetic and the environmental factors that affect host response to infection. Uh, you can imagine how complex malaria is and the number of factors that can affect how different individuals and populations and ethnic groups uh, respond to infection. So as the, um, in, during the course of infection, as the parasite goes, undergoes the liver stage, then transitions into the blood stage, the immune system tries to control the infection or eliminate the, uh, the parasite. But you can also imagine the number of interactions that can take place between the parasite and the host, and that's basically the focus of our work. And this is all to say that malaria is very complex, like, like most infectious diseases anyways. So the number of factors that can define the outcome of the infection range from factors related to the parasite itself, to its genetic makeup, to the functional output of the parasite, its RNA, its proteins and metabolites, as well as the host genetic factors. Again, ranging from genetic, epigenetic uh, factors, host molecules. And on top of this, you have a lot of uh, processes that relate specifically to the immune system and the environment. So environmental factors as well can uh, affect these uh, sort of interactions. So the focus of our studies have been uh, transcriptomics or gene expression profiling in the last decade or so. And more recently, we've been trans transitioning to uh, looking at other types of functional outputs in the system, like the metabolome. So it's fascinating when you think how um, two organisms, one with a few thousand genes and one with 22,000 protein coding genes, interact with each other during this course of uh, infection. And these interactions are very important because they really define the outcome of the infection, whether it relates to the phenotypes or the traits of the, of the human host, or the traits of the that are related to the parasite like parastemia. And in, in the, all, all of these processes, as I mentioned earlier, can be affected by genetic and environmental factors. So the program that we set up that I presented, uh, I think five years ago, is the, in Burkina Faso. So we have a wonderful collaboration with the team of Dr. Uh, Sulema Isiaka. And since then, we decided to uh, recruit a cohort. It's a small cohort of 150 children from the Guan ethnic group in, in uh, the Bamfora region of Burkina Faso. And we decided to focus completely on in vivo phenotypes. And the idea was really to sample children over time uh, during the course of infection, before infection, after infection, uh, and, and in, in two or three years of time. And this really requires a lot of collaboration from the local community leaders and nurses and a wonderful team of uh, young African scientists as well that are part of the uh, team of uh, uh, ISIACA. So in terms of the technical approaches that we use in this program, they, uh, we try to really maximize how we can use these biological samples. So, and our focus again is blood stage malaria. So what we do, we collect blood samples and we developed uh, a lot of protocols to be able from relatively small samples of volumes of blood to be able to do DNA work, RNA work, serum, as well as PBMCs. And today I'm going to be focusing mainly on the work that uh, we've been doing in the last, uh, I would say, five years, which is mainly on total RNA-seq, microRNA, and metabolomics. So for the first study, which is really focused on looking at the uh, immune response, uh, in relation to microRNA. And I actually, I presented the preliminary results of this project in Kigali. And, but since then we made a lot of progress and uh, that's what I'm gonna be presenting in the next 10 minutes. So the idea was really simple. We want to focus on a group of children before infection and the design, because malaria is, is, is seasonal in, 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 in Burkina Faso. We have an opportunity to actually sample children before infection and follow them over time and do weekly visits uh, and sometimes bi-weekly visits and we can really track when they get infected. And in this regard, we've been able to uh, sample about 20 children during the asymptomatic parastemia stage, meaning that they don't show any symptoms, but we've actually detected the parasite in their blood. And then we keep following them again on a weekly basis till they have symptoms and then we sample them again. 
And then they are given the uh, uh, treatment and we sample them three weeks after. And again, this is a match design, which means that it's a very nice way to control for other variables. And so it's not a cross-sectional design. So we've done this for one year and then we went back the following year where we did the replication study where we focused mainly on symptomatic parasitemia and again in the same area of Burkina Faso. So once we have blood samples, we extract total RNA and we construct a microRNA library. It's quite different from my, uh, uh, like a regular uh, RNA-seq library. It has extra steps because you have to run a gen and cut exactly the band with the microRNA. Uh, transcripts are, and as you can see here, the, uh, the, uh, the microRNA library, as you can see here, was very nicely captured, and then we do sequencing. And using this method, we detected 320 microRNAs in these individuals, and this is uh, actually exactly the plot that I think I presented in Kigali uh, a couple of years ago. So what we see here, we do differential microRNA expression analysis, which means that we want to detect which microRNA go up or down. And because we have the four stages, we can really see exactly those changes uh, in, uh, and how they change over time. So as you can see in the first plot, the, uh, we have some microRNA that are upregulated and some other microRNA are downregulated. And this is from before infection to the asymptomatic uh, parasitemia stage, which really tells you that there are ch changes that are taking place early during the infection. And then once the children transition to uh, the uh, symptomatic parasitemia stage, you can see some sort of an amplification of signal with the same microRNA being uh, magnified in terms of the up or down regulation, in addition to other microRNA that are also differentially expressed. And what's very interesting is that after treatment, three weeks after treatment, you see the opposite effect. So what we see here is like the if the micronome reverts to before infection status. So microRNA that are upregulated during asymptomatic parasitemia start to actually be downregulated and vice versa. MicroRNA that are downregulated during asymptomatic parasitemia, they start to go in up again. And this is again, really a clear indication of how fast changes in microRNA can take place in the uh, blood of children. So in the replication study, we focused mainly on parasitemia as one of the main phenotypes that we are interested in. And we were very pleased to actually uh, detect a lot of microRNA that are positively correlated with par parasitemia that are upregulated during infection and vice versa, with the exception of one microRNA. So this was really indicative of a potential association between parasitemia and those microRNA, hence probably a functional, uh, with some functional consequences. And in total, we've detected 127 microRNA that are either induced by infection or are associated with parasitemia. And that was the focus of our uh, uh, works uh, in the last couple of years. So to show you examples, these are two microRNA that one is positively correlated with parasitemia and one is negatively correlated with parasitemia. And when we see these patterns, you basically there is no direct link between parasitemia and microRNA. MicroRNA, they, they have regulatory roles, so they target specific uh, messenger RNAs. And to be able to try to detect them, what we did, we did RNA seq profiling of the same children. And then we did cross correlation between RNA seq for messenger RNA and RNA seq for microRNA. And we've detected over 1,000 pairs of microRNA and messenger RNA that are anti-correlated. And that was our focus because an anti-correlation or negative correlation between the two hints to the fact that those microRNA are actually inhibiting those uh, messenger RNA or causing degradation or, and, and, and hence you won't have uh, a translation from uh, messenger RNA. And here again, I'm showing two examples of those uh, uh, pairs of microRNA and target messenger RNA. Uh, and because uh, these pairs of microRNA, messenger RNA, some of them have actually been functionally validated as being targets and not just uh, predicted uh, using computational methods that was our focus. And the most interesting gene that we discovered is BSL2, which is an anti-apoptotic gene. Now, when we take the thousand messenger RNA that are negatively correlated with microRNA, we did enrichment analysis and we discovered that the top pathway that is actually enriched is cell death and survival. 
Other, other pathways are also affected, but our focus was really on this cell death and survival. And the reason for that is because of this gene, PSL2, which is an anti-apoptotic gene. So which means when the gene is expressed, the cells don't undergo apoptosis. If the gene is downregulated, then you trigger apoptotic processes. We looked, and this is looking at the data from the uh, uh, replication uh, study. When we look in the uh, discovery study, we see also very nice anti-correlation in all the stages of infection. You can clearly see how when this microRNA goes up, this target gene goes down. And then we decided to really further this, uh, uh, look at this further because the uh, potential consequence of these changes is that it will trigger, trigger apoptosis of immune genes in the system. And because we have uh, generated uh, the uh, the uh, lymphocyte counts from these children, we've seen a very nice correlation between lymphocyte counts and the BSL2 gene, or an anti-correlation between the microRNA and the lymphocyte, which hints again to an effect that has consequences on lymphocyte counts. We did we did a follow up with a, uh, a nice small functional assay where we took this microRNA 16 and we did a controlled experiment with hex cells and HeLa cells where we could show that uh, actually this indeed this microRNA actually triggers apoptosis as you can see here with so, so with cell viability dropping from 100% to uh, about 70% on average. Okay, so as a follow-up of this, we decided to really look at the genetic makeup of these children and see if some of these uh, microRNA are actually genetically controlled. And because we have whole genome sequencing data from this cohort, we've done an uh, EQTL study for this microRNA. And we discovered 34 microRNA that are controlled uh, that are controlled by regulatory SNPs. And all these SNPs, because of the limited power of this analysis, we focused completely on uh, cis effects and completely ignore trans effects for this analysis. And what you can see here, this is a Manhattan plot that shows some examples. This is one of the most interesting uh, signals that we detected. It's this microRNA, uh, here microRNA 598, which is associated with this SNP. And as you can see here, the minor allele uh, uh, is associated with low expression of this microRNA. And this is just fine mapping to see that the signal actually is nicely captures the, despite actually the challenges of association mapping in, our, in Africa because of the LD structure of the population. So this again, we're very pleased with this result because again, this shows the importance of using in the phenotypes in African populations where you can gain actually a lot of power. Now, when we look at the, if we completely ignore microRNA and we look at the association between the SNP and parastemia, we've actually see, we see this correlation or this association with the minor allele associated with low levels of parastemia, which is really interesting. We, we've seen the same signal between microRNA and the infection stage in our uh, discovery uh, cohort. And interestingly, we see this very nice strong co positive correlation between parastemia and microRNA. And the model really that we came up with is really suggestive that there is an effect of this SNP on parastemia, and it's mediated by microRNA. And this was supported by statistical analysis of the data. Now, the, this is much more complex than what I'm showing you here, because you can, as I mentioned earlier, uh, for the BSL2 gene, we don't know for sure what are the target genes of this microRNA and how it relates to parastemia in terms of this positive correlation that we see here. And that's basically the focus of our next uh, research on this topic. So I didn't go over all the details that we went through in this project, but these results have been published last year in this publication, if you are interested. Okay, so next we decided to really switch our focus to uh, studying the metabolome of those children. And the metabolome is, is very interesting in many ways. So metabolites are small molecules that are present in the system that we are studying, and they they are much more reflective of physiology. They are much more closely uh, uh, or close to phenotypes compared to microRNA or messenger RNA, for example. And that was really one of the main reasons why we wanted to look at them. So the model that we have is that metabolites can change with infection, and these metabolites can have effects on host gene expression. 
They can also affect directly immune response of the host, but they can also affect parasitemia or any other trait of the, of the uh, parasite. And those interactions can also be vice versa, meaning that uh, metabolites can be byproducts of uh, biological processes of the parasite or the host. So it's really a nice system to look at parasite, uh, host parasite interactions. Okay, so what we did, we went and back to the same cohort, the Guan cohort, and in this case, we, we've uh, profiled more individuals. So we focused on 100 individuals before infection and during infection. And you can see here basically that no parasitemia was detected before infection. And during infection, you can see this very nice uh, range of parasitemia levels going from very low to very high parasitemia. And then we isolated serum samples and we did high resolution metabolomic profiling using the metabolome uh, platform. With this data, we've done a lot of annotation of these metabolites and we focus completely on the known metabolites. With these metabolites, then we can do uh, analysis that are similar to what we do with gene expression, including PCA, differentially abundance analysis and pathway enrichment analysis. Okay, so the first question we wanted to answer is, okay, what is the impact of infection on, on serum metabolome? Does the metabolome change with infection? This is the number, total number of metabolites that we detected in the serum of these uh, children. So in total, 667, and they have they, they belong to different classes. Uh, mainly lipids and amino acids are the two major classes, but there are other classes, as you can see in the figure. So when we do principal component analysis of this data, you can see very clearly the effect of infection on the metabolome. So in blue, you have the children before infection. In the red, you have the same children, because remember, this is matched analysis. So the red are the same children after infection, and you see this nice separation between the two, which again clearly shows that the effect of infection is very strong on the metabolome. Next, we did the differential abundance analysis, and we used these thresholds for change greater than 1.5, and if they are of 10%. And in, in this analysis, basically, we detected uh, 195 metabolites that are either enriched or depleted. So enriched in red, as you can see here, or depleted, as you can see in blue here. And in triangles, I'm showing you the metabolites that are associated with parasitemia. And again, very, very similar to what we've seen with microRNA, the, almost all the uh, my, metabolites that are actually upregulated during infection are positively associated with parasitemia and vice versa. Okay, now we, we take this data and we do a pathway enrichment analysis. We've seen a lot of signal in this data that most top like enriched pathways really, really reflect the biology of the parasite. And today, because uh, my focus is really the host, I'm not going to be talking about uh, this uh, data that relates to the parasite. So I'm going to focus completely on the host immune response. So specifically what really attracted our attention was this uh, signal that we've seen in terms of the uh, steroid biosynthesis or steroidogenesis. This was really surprising to us, uh, in large part because of the role of steroids in uh, immune regulation. And this is also take home message to really not always focus just on the pathways that are uh, the most significant. Sometimes you can have a really strong biological signal in, in pathways that are not necessarily the most significant. Okay, so when we look at steroids, they, they are actually the most, the, the most uh, abundant class of molecules that is uh, differentially abundant. And when we look specifically at those that are associated with parasitemia and that are elevated, we've detected 20, uh, sorry, 12 out of, out of, out of 37 being, uh, being in this class, which is, means upregulation and associated with parasitemia. And here I'm showing you a heat map of the data where you can see them and you can clearly see. So each column is one child and we have basically 100 children here and the same 100 children here. And there is a perfect clustering based on, on infection status. And you can see in red, which reflects the levels going up, you can see that all of them basically going up after infection. Here I'm showing you an example of a uh, steroid called pregnidiol sulfate. And you can clearly see that the, the, uh, this metabolite or this steroid goes up after infection. And it is, as, as you see here, it is associated with parasitemia. Okay, 
So steroids, as I mentioned, are really interesting. They are classes of molecules that are sex hormone precursors, but can also function as inflammatory regulators. And specifically, they have anti-inflammatory responses, which means that they dampen the uh, immune system. So because we have the uh, lymphocyte count, we decided to look at this, because if you have an elevation of, of anti-inflammatory molecules, you will be able to see uh, uh, down regulation or reduction of lymphocyte counts. So we did cross-correlation between all these steroids and cell counts and hemoglobin. And as you can see here, we don't see any correlation whatsoever in, in, in positive or negative between lymphocytes and steroids, as you can see here uh, with one example. Interestingly, when we look at the, uh, the same data, but during infection, you can clearly see that we see this very strong negative correlation between the most of the steroids and lymphocyte counts, as you can see here as well as negative correlation with parastemia. So this, we were very intrigued by, by this uh, finding because this really would hint to the, to the idea that these steroids, when they go up during infection, they will uh, have an effect on lymphocyte function. So to be able to gain more functional insight about this uh, hypothesis, we decided to go back to our transcriptomic data and we focused on 36 children and we did integrative analysis of metabolomic and transcriptomic data. We looked specifically at those 11 steroids and we cross-correlated them with over 12,000 transcripts. And we focus on uh, the uh, pairs of metabolites and steroids and RNAs that are significant. So in, on, we've done this in, in, in both the data sets before infection and during infection. And interestingly, before infection, we don't detect a lot of uh, significant correlations. As you can see here, 61 and 49, either negative or positive correlation. But during infection, this number uh, increases to over 1,500 negatively correlated pairs and over 2,000 positively correlated steroid RNA pairs. To show you this is an example, this is a gene of interest because it's actually involved in one of the synthesis pathways of this metabolite or this steroid. And it, that's exactly what I mentioned earlier. You can see that before infection in blue, we don't see any correlation whatsoever between this gene and this metabolite. But during infection, you see this very strong correlation, positive correlation between expression of the gene and the steroid. And again, it makes complete biological sense because this gene is involved in the biosynthesis pathway of this steroid. And then we took all those genes that are uh, uh, significantly associated with these steroids and we do ingenuity enrichment analysis both in the before infection and during infection stage and you can clearly see here that there is a signal that relates specifically to t-cell function or lymphocytes in general and this effect is not significant whatsoever before infection and the z-score here indicates either inhibition in blue or activation in red of those pathways. In particular, what I really would like to highlight are the fact that what we observe is a strong uh, inhibition of T-cell activation signaling pathways and strong activation of T-cell exhaustion signaling pathway, including the, the PDL1 signaling pathway. So again, a combination of activation and inhibition of pathways, but they all hint to inhibition of T-cell function or lymphocytes in general. So I won't have time to go into the details. We've done a lot of uh, follow-up statistical analysis to really look at the, uh, at the effects between the transcriptome and the steroids and lymphocytes count. And they, they, uh, through this analysis that we call causal mediation moderation analysis, we now have strong evidence that these metabolites affect lymphocyte count through regulation of these master regulators of T-cell function. This is the list that we looked at. And before infection, we don't see a strong signal or strong mediation signal for most of the genes. And as you can see here, during the infection, we see a very strong mediation effect. And when I say moderation on top of mediation, what I mean is, is that this effect is only seen during infection. Because keeping in mind those metabolites and genes are actually present before infection, but the relationship between them doesn't have any effect on lymphocyte counts before infection. We only see it during infection. Okay, now we, uh, because we have this strong evidence from, from integrative analysis and from statistical analysis, 
we went back to the lab and we did an ex vivo functional validation. We recruited 10 individuals and we looked at their PVMCs. And specifically what we do, we look at one of the strongest uh, steroids that we've detected and we culture those uh, uh, PBMCs, we stimulate them with anti-CD3, CD28, and then after, after 24 hours, we add the, uh, the steroid that we want to test. And the hypothesis is that if these steroids have an inhibitory effect on T-cell function, we will be able to see that using FOX analysis. So as I mentioned, we've done this for uh, 10 individuals. Here I'm showing you the data for two individuals. And in the first plot here, what you can see we, when we don't stimulate or add the steroid, we don't see any changes in, the, in these populations of cells. When we, add, when we don't stimulate and add the steroid, also nothing happens because this, this uh, steroid doesn't stimulate those cells. But, and when we only add stimulation, you can see the shift in this population of cells, which really is indicative of proliferation. And when we add the steroid, as you can see in these individuals, we are inhibiting very significantly proliferations of cells and you don't see the shift that you can see here. Same thing for this individual. And this was done for 10 individuals. This is looking at the data from all the individuals that we are said. And what you can see here again is clear reduction in the proliferation index of uh, lymphocytes specifically in these individuals. So this kind of really supports all the hypotheses that were generated from the integrative analysis. Okay, so now just in the last two or three minutes, uh, I'll show you the most recent results that we obtained as part of this project. This is exactly what I showed you earlier. What we've seen is that in the one ethnic group, we've seen this elevation of steroids. We decided to go back to the field the following year and look at and ask specific questions. Of, okay, if we see this in the one, what happens in, in other ethnic groups? And in Burkina Faso, you have multiple ethnic groups. One of the most interesting groups are the Fulani, and the Fulani are known to have lower susceptibility to malaria relative to other ethnic groups. So when we did exactly replicated the study using exactly the same methodologies and exactly the same statistical analysis and combining the data, to our big surprise, we saw completely the opposite trend in the Fulani, as you can see here. So this is a volcano plot. Uh, the same way as we generated this one and what you see here either those steroids they don't change or some of them actually are down regulated we lose in statistical power here because we only had data from 53 individuals as opposed to 100 for the guan this is a heat map that's showing you the data for these four classes the guan before infection after infection for lani before infection and after infection and what's really really interesting is what you see here you can clearly see that the guan before infection are actually more similar to the Fulani who are infected, which really shows again that the Fulani, they don't respond the same way as the infected guan that you can see here, where we see this very significant upregulation. Just to show you an example, this is an example of one of those steroids going down in the uh, Fulani and going up in the in the one this is a very nice example of of an interaction effect again between uh, uh, ethnic group or, or, or ethnicity and I, i'm not here focusing on genetics or the environment i'm really just looking at both ethnic groups with all the variables that they carry whether it's genetics or environment to show you the data the lymphocyte data which, which is also uh, rep uh, supports the evidence of our findings what you see here in the in the Fulani and in the one there is no correlation between the uh, steroids and the lymphocyte counts, but in the one, you see this negative correlation that we don't see in the Fulani. So this is again indicative that in the Fulani, we don't see this, uh, this upregulation of anti-inflammatory uh, steroids, which supports the idea that they, and this is already known actually about the Fulani, that they have this uh, property of uh, uh, a stronger immune response when, when they are infected. So with this, uh, just as a summary, so the model that really we're well proposing here is that uh, what we're discovering in the Guan ethnic group is that there is this elevation of steroids that are associated with, with infection and parasitemia, which have an inhibitory effect on T cell function and potentially on other cells as well, which also can affect parasitemia. And we see opposing trends in the Fulani and the Guan, this negative correlation between steroids and lymphocytes, which we don't see in the Fulani. 
And if you are interested in more details, this uh, the results have been published in the um, in Nature Metabolism in the issue of July, and also attracted a lot of attention from the community with some nice commentaries by uh, the immunology field and infectious disease as well.